preachings every Sunday morning, okay? And, uh, and we praise the Lord that we have uh, people here who really don't mind the time as long as uh, the Word of God is being preached. Amen? Amen. Yes, I've been here. Because looking at the time, uh, it's 11.16, so I hope that we'll be able to finish uh, before our stomachs remind us that it's already time to stop. Okay, so let us go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you for the passage that we have read uh, in Second Corinthians chapter 11. I pray, Lord, that you help us uh, have a deeper understanding of these verses and see, dear Lord, um, how important they are in our lives. Uh, as individuals and as, as a church as well. I pray, Lord, that you open the minds of everyone as you have uh, taught me in this chapter. I pray, Lord, that you help me as well uh, explain this uh, with your, by your grace that we will be able to uh, understand and we will be able to apply this in our lives. I pray, Lord, that this message will be a challenge. I pray, Lord, that everyone will have an open heart, dear Lord, and a humble spirit to realize that whatever that the Word of God this morning will say that is uh, contrary to what we believe personally, that we will submit, dear Lord, our own personal principles to the principle that is in your Word. I pray that you bless uh, me as I, I preach. May your name, only your name be glorified. May this uh, preaching not be a stumbling block to any, but be an encouragement and challenge. For all these things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we have read uh, 2 Corinthians 11, 1 to 15. So you can see, I have coffee here. Uh, I hope you know what it means. And uh, yeah, because I'm working on, uh, I don't know, a few hours of sleep only because uh, JL uh, uh, had fever uh, early, very early uh, uh, this morning. So uh, please bear with me. And as we have read this uh, morning in uh, verse 1, Paul started with uh, "Bear with me," so that that would be that would not be the title of the message. But the title of the message today is "Paul's Folly." Okay, Paul's Folly. Folly here means foolishness, or uh, something that is not really uh, expedient or, or help helpful. Okay, but here in the in the beginning of uh, in the first part of chapter eleven, we are not going to take all the the whole chapter, but we will only take until verse fifteen. And hopefully we'll be able to uh, breeze through this, but not not uh, uh, sacrificing the truths that are very that are uh, written inside here. In the first part of this chapter, Paul felt the need to defend his uh, credentials. Okay, as if you remember in the previous chapter, my previous preaching, they have been accusing Paul of being too soft or too weak in his speech and too. Uh, a week in his presentation of the message of the Lord. And they have uh, mistaken his humility and his meek meekness to weakness. Okay, so now Paul uh, will now indulge them in what they want. And now Paul will start to boast somewhat or to protect his credibility here in, uh, here in chapter 11. Now, uh, it, we, we'll, we'll go verse by verse here. I don't really have any points here, but we, we'll go through the verses and see principles as we, as we go. Uh, in verse 1, it says here, Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly. Now, uh, Paul starts the, the chapter here, or, or uh, Paul starts writing here saying that, uh, I pray to the Lord that you can bear with me a little in my folly. As I have said, folly means foolishness. Now, Paul is uh, admitting that what he's uh, going to do might be something that is not expedient to others. It might be something in Paul's mind that something that I, 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 could, have, I could do something better, I could write something better, but I feel the need of doing this instead. He says, Dear, uh, he says here, bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed, bear with me. Okay, he repeats it twice. He say, he's, he's telling them that, okay, uh, you, you sh for those of you who understand, or those of you who are spiritual, bear with me. You know I'm not like this. You know my, my testimony. You know, I, uh, you know how I am when I am there. But since my hand is being forced to do this, please bear with me. Okay, that is what Paul is uh, saying here. As I have said last week, sometimes uh, a leader or a pastor has to do something which is not consistent with his character 
in order for, uh, uh, for the benefit of the church. Now, this is what Paul is doing. He knows that what he's about to do is not consistent with his character. He doesn't really like boasting about what he does. He doesn't really like boasting about what uh, Christ has done through him. It, and uh, uh, Actually, Paul in other verses says that the only thing I have to boast of is Christ. Amen. The only thing that I have to glory of is Christ. But since you're forcing me here, and I think that the only way I can make you understand is to, uh, is to do a little bit of boasting. So make you realize who I really am. To remind you of who I really am. So now bear with me a little bit in my folly. This is foolishness. This might be a waste of time. This might be something that is a way for you to, to criticize me even more. But this can be a way for you to be open, for your eyes to be open and see that is something important that I want you to understand. Now what are these things that Paul wants them to understand? Uh, why is he doing this? In verse 2, he says here, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. Now Paul makes it clear that, that what I'm about to do is not something that I'm doing out of the flesh. This is something that God has imparted in my heart. Now Paul says here godly jealousy. This is something God has impressed in me. This is a jealousy that God has put in my heart for you. Not selfish jealousy because godly jealousy is different from human jealousy. Yeah. Iba po yung pagselos ng Panginoon sa pagselos ng Tao. Okay, it is completely different. Uh, uh, human, human jealousy is dangerous, but godly jealousy is jealousy that is out of love. In Exodus chapter 20 verse 5, it says here, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Now, godly jealousy is simply this. God knows that if us, if we, will put out, will, will give our hearts to other gods, or will give our hearts uh, uh, to someone other than God, God knows that, that uh, our morality or the way we live depends on that. That's why He is jealous. He's not actually jealous of us, He's jealous for us. That is, that is the difference, okay? Je God is jealous for us. He, he wants us to keep loving Him with all our hearts. Without, an, uh, He will not share that love with any other gods. He will not share that love with any other person. But God said, you love me completely and your loyalty has to be with me. Why? Because He knows that that's the only way we can live the Christian life properly. That is godly jealousy. But contrast, con in contrast to that, human jealousy, is, on the other hand, is something that destroys people. Human jealousy is selfish. Human jealousy, uh, jealousy infringes the right of other people. Okay? Uh, for those of you who are old enough to understand what I'm saying, uh, human jealousy is something that is not really good to feel. The reason why you're jealous is because you are afraid. The reason why you're jealous is because uh, uh, you are insecure. The reason why you're jealous is because you think that something that belongs to you is being taken away. Okay? Uh, kaya nga po, uh, that's why for those, especially for those who are just starting to, uh, or starting in that uh, relationship, I remember when I was very young, when I started, uh, uh, you know, I feel that kind of thing, right? Jealousy. Now you, uh, I, I, I hear my dad talk about how he is when he's jealous. I don't know how you are when you're jealous. I have an idea with, for some of you. I know how I am when I'm jealous. Uh, it's not good. You don't say good things. You don't uh, do good things. All you say is bad things. All you think are bad things. That's so why jealousy destroys even lives. Jealousy, dis jealousy destroys even families. That's why we need to learn how to place that properly. That's why I always tell my wife, don't get jealous with basketball. No, it will destroy our family. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay, well, but uh, that is, uh, that is uh, human jealousy. It destroys. That's what, that is what Cain felt with Abel. Uh, with Abel and then he killed Abel. That's why this, uh, this God, godly jealousy or what Paul is feeling is completely different from what, from what we think of jealousy. So Paul says here, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. Paul here was boasting a little bit. Okay? By his own admission, this might be folly to, to a lot of you because he wants these people to understand that their hearts were being divided. He wants them to understand that. Now, God is jealous. You have to love the Lord with all your heart. You know, here in the, uh, God is always concerned with our hearts. When, whenever He looks, you remember when, when uh, uh, Samuel was looking for the new king, God said, don't look at his uh, outward appearance, at his countenance, but God looked at the heart. 
God is always concerned about our hearts. He's always concerned if we love Him more than anything in this world. He's always concerned if we're giving our 100% love to Him, 100% loyalty to Him. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Matthew 22, 37, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Proverbs 3, 1 to 2. My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Joel chapter 2, verse 12. Therefore also now saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning. Proverbs 21, 2 says, Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the hearts. That's why as God looks at our hearts, we must also guard our hearts. Amen. Because the Bible says our heart is deceitful. And if we are going to let our hearts follow our flesh, then, we, then God says that I am jealous of that. Okay? God knows that sin starts from your heart being divided. Sin starts because of a wrong heart. Uh, uh, wrongdoing starts because there you put, put things in your heart that are, that are not supposed to be there. That's why God commanded to love Him with all our hearts. Nothing else with all our hearts. No place for anyone else. Okay? Because if you love God with all your hearts, everything will fall into its place. But then, Paul says here, I'm boasting a little. You need to understand. I'm going to this extreme measure. I'm not really a proud person. I don't really want to do this, but this is important. You have to realize that your hearts right now are being divided. Not, you're not loving God. Uh, uh, let's continue the verse here. For I have espouse you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Now Paul is boasting a little because he wants them to understand that I have a responsibility towards you. I have a responsibility. Paul is picturing himself as a friend to the bridegroom. A friend to the groom. Here in uh, John chapter 3 verse 29 it says here, He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom which standeth and heareth him rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This is my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. Now, the friend of the bridegroom stands as a witness to the bride's uh, character and purity until the day of their marriage. That is the, the, that is the job of the friend of the bridegroom. Now, going to Paul, he says that, I have espoused you to one husband, which is Christ, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. He is protecting and keeping the bride spotless until Christ returns. Now, brethren, we are married to Christ. Someday we're going to get, uh, we are engaged to Christ. We're going to get married to Christ. Now, the job of our leaders and overseers, the reason why they're called overseers, is to make sure that we don't have divided loyalty during this engagement period. Because well, uh, if we are not going to be pure, if we are not going to, to have this uh, uh, pure loyalty to God and love to God during this engagement period, then the overseer has practically failed to do his job. That is, that, is, that is very clear. Now, I know that members have their own choices, have their own free will, but it is the heart of the Apostle Paul as, as well as the heart of other uh, leaders of the church to do whatever they can, however, however uh, they think of, of, of a way to do it, to, to make people realize that you are Christ and you are only to be for Christ. Amen. Don't divide your loyalty. That's why Paul says, I have to go to this extreme measure. I'm going to boast. Why? Because God is being jealous of your heart and you have to realize that you're going to be married to Christ and I have to present you pure to the Lord Jesus Christ okay now uh, Paul felt that this folly was necessary so that they will understand that they are to be married to Christ but I fear less by any means okay jealousy is always uh, accompanied by fear kaya ka naman nagsiselos may kinakatakutan ka diba the reason why you're jealous is because you fear that something might be taken away from you the reason why you're jealous is because you fear that you might not experience the same things that other people are experiencing. Now, Paul here, you're, you're jealous because you fear that someday uh, 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 the person that you want to spend your life with might be swept away by someone else, right? That's, that is uh, a human jealousy. Now, Paul here is jealous and he fears that, the verse says, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. That is his, one of his fears. Now, Paul knows the devil is subtle. And we also have to know that. We don't have to be ignorant about that. You know, sometimes we underestimate our enemy. Sometimes we look at ourselves as, as someone who's very spiritual that we cannot be defeated by the devil. You know, if the devil was, be, was able to defeat Adam and Eve, how much more you? 
Okay, Adam and Eve who's living in a place where there's no sin around them. Perfect place. Something that will not, nothing will entice them to sin except that serpent. But despite that, the serpent was so subtle, was so wise that he was able to deceive them. How much more us? We're surrounded by, by, by wickedness. We're surrounded by sin. You open the internet, there's sin. You, open, you, 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 turn on, uh, you, you uh, go on Facebook, there's sin. Uh, there are a lot of things in this life that will entice you to sin. And Satan is using all of those things. It's very subtle. Music. Okay? Uh, the things that you read. The news. Everything the Satan is using, and Satan is even getting into the churches to, to beguile us, to, to, to make sure that we will not remain pure during this engagement period to Christ. Now, the, the, uh, here in uh, the account of uh, Satan beguiling Eve, Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 to 5. Let me read quickly. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Yea, hath God said, ye shall, ye shall not eat of everything of the garden. Now, Satan starts off here. This is, this is always his tactic. Satan starts off by questioning the word of God. No, now Satan, whenever he starts to beguile you or to fool you, he starts by uh, having you question the word of God. Did God really say this? Is this what God really means? Because uh, uh, the, the question, did God really say this, is clear because we have the Bible. If, God, if it's there, then God said it. But the question nowadays in our time is, is that what God really means? Is that what He really means? Uh, did God really say that? Did God really say that you cannot be uh, married to unbelievers? Is that what God really means? I think it's not. right? Maybe you should rethink that. Maybe you should rethink your principles. Is there, is, did God really say that you have to, to, to always attend uh, church services? Uh, as he says in Hebrews 10, 25. Was that what he really means? Because that verse was questioned. I, I read in the internet that, uh, uh, that uh, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together doesn't really mean coming to church every Sunday. It basically means that uh, I forgot what he said. I, I, I purposely forgot about it. But they're questioning even that verse. Is that what God really means? Now, you don't really have to go to church. You can worship God everywhere, right? Uh, you can worship God in your house. You can worship God wherever you are if you're traveling. You can just uh, uh, close your eyes and pray, sing a song silently, read the Bible. You worship God and you've done your duty. Hey, but that's not what the Bible says. The Bible is not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. To assemble with other believers. You cannot assemble alone. Okay, you're not Voltes 5. Even the Voltes 5, there are five of them. Right, you cannot assemble alone. You have to, you have to, uh, uh, you have to be with the people of God. Now, uh, now this, the devil starts off that way. You question the word of God. That's why if you're, trying to, you're starting to question what God really is saying in the Bible, be careful. That's the devil planting it in your mind. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. Now the Bible says don't add or remove anything from the word of God. That is wrong that is a sin but Eve here is is equally uh, guilty of what Satan is doing God only said that you shall not eat of it God did not say neither shall you touch it uh, um, um, uh, uh, what do you call this Eve started to add to the Word of God now if you start start questioning the Word of God then that's when you start adding or removing from it that's when you start correcting the Word of God. That's when you start thinking that, hey, I think I know better than the people who translated this version. I think this means that. I think it's missing a word. I think we should remove this word. That's what they're doing today. These very smart scholars, uh, oh no, this is not what really uh, the Bible says. You know, the originals did uh, what, what, what it means is this. So this word has to be removed. This word had to be added. This verse has to be removed. That's what they're doing. Why? Because they started questioning the word of God. Now they're starting to add and remove things from that. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Now when he starts getting you to question the word of God and starts getting you to think that you're better than, than, than the copy that you have of the word of God, now he starts to blatantly deny the word of God. And that's happening today. Uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Does God really love the world? Not all the world. Uh, Christ died for all. Did he really die for all? The Bible says Christ died for all. Amen. Why do you really have to question the word all? Right? Because they think they're better. They think they're better than the word of God. For, uh, that, that is, 
That, that is what is happening today. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. He starts you to question the word of God. He starts you to think that you're better than the word of God. He starts to blatantly reject the word of God. And now he starts to portray God as something that is evil. So that you will just completely abandon God. This is, that's what, hap uh, what happens with people who just leave the church. Uh, I don't think that's what the Bible really means because my experience doesn't jive with what the Bible says. I don't think that's what, the Bible, what, that's what the Bible really means because I've experienced something different. This is what other people say. So I think this is what's correct. And you start entertaining that in your mind, then you find yourself someday away from the church of God, away from the Word of God, not even wanting to even to have anything to do with the Word of God. Now God starts to be your enemy. Now the, mostly this happens with people who only think they're saved. Because if the Holy Spirit is with you, uh, the Holy Spirit will always convict you otherwise. But let us not think that we will not fall like Eve. Because Paul says, I am jealous and I am afraid that as, as, a, as a Satan was able to, do, to beguile Eve, he says here that your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. That is why he has this godly jealousy. He's afraid that they will be corrupted from the what? From the simplicity. This is their accusation of him. He's very simple. All he does is say what the word of God is, nothing else. He doesn't add to it. Walang, there's no, he's not jumping, he's not, blow, he's not eating, uh, he's not stepping on a uh, broken glass, he's not breathing fire. You know, he's, he's, he's really weak. All he does is read the scriptures and explain a little bit. Now, now for them, that simplicity is nothing. They don't respect that. They don't, they don't realize that they are really despising the very character of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Christ is meek. Christ is humble. And if they detest that in Paul, then they will actually detest that in the, the very person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, remember, that is what they are accusing uh, Paul of. Sometimes, as believers, we are guilty because we are enticed by preachings that are really bombastic. We are enticed by preachers who are animated. We're enticed by preachers who use a lot of uh, illustrations, stories, personal experiences, uh, even props. Uh, I've, I've seen preachers use props in the pulpit before. Uh, they, they bring whatever <laughs> in the pulpit. But all you need is the Word of God, right? Sometimes we are guilty of that. Why? Because we get bored by the plain preaching of the Word of God. Now we need entertainment. You know, it, it won't hurt if the preacher jumps once or twice. It doesn't hurt if the pre preacher uh, goes away from the Bible like five to ten minutes during the preaching so that we won't fall asleep. Right? That's the reason why I have this cough here. But, but, the, Bible, but the Bible says that uh, uh, Paul knows that the preaching of the Word of God has to be simple. God is delighted in the plain, simple preaching of the Word of God. Amen. He doesn't need your help to explain His Word. You know, if the Bible is not simple, then um, uh, if, if, if God really needs us to add uh, gimmicks or, 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 or uh, uh, illustrations of all these things just to be able, for you to be able to understand the Word of God, then we can claim credit, some credit for ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. But the plain reading of the Word of God can convict you. You can just sit in a corner, read the Word of God, pray to the Lord, you will be convicted. Does it need anything else? Just read the Word of God. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that illustrations are bad, no. All of us use illustrations. All I'm saying is we don't put emphasis on that. Emphasis is in the Word of God. Now, some Christians are just bored with plain preaching. I, I, I know that. That's why, uh, personally, I personally really, really don't care if people are bored with the way I preach. Because uh, I know this is the right way to preach. Uh, I, I, I read uh, uh, books that are saying that expository preaching is what's destroying Christianity today. Like, like if you're just preaching from the Word of God, I can also read the Bible, so I don't have to go there. You're just reading the Bible. So I just read the Bible at home. The reason why I come to church is to be entertained. You know, it's not like that. If you, if you, if you go to church to be entertained, then, uh, what do you call this? Then, then, then don't go to church. There are other places to be entertained better than the church. You know, sometimes in church, jokes are corny. That's why uh, sometimes uh, uh, even if the preacher is uh, saying a joke with all their might and with all their heart and with all their soul, it's not even funny. It's not entertaining. You know what? You come to church to know the Word of God. And that should be your mindset here. We should not be like this Corinthian believer. They're looking for eloquent speech. 
They're looking for, for great illustrations. They're looking for uh, great preachers. You know, what you have to look for is a great God that is seen in the Bible that is preached by, behind the pulpit. Amen. Now, how, how are, uh, and, and this is what, this is what, uh, what do you call this, these false prophets are doing. You know, remember, uh, here in the last chapters of Second Corinthians, Paul is always uh, taking a shot at these false prophets in the church. He's taking a shot at them verse after verse after verse. Because these are the culprits, right? Now, how are we to know that the, these are the, the ministers of uh, Satan? By comparing their message to the truth of the word of God. The verse says, the next verse says, For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or another gospel which ye have not accepted. The only way we can know false preaching is if we know the truth. The only way we can know false doctrine is if we know the truth. There's no way that you will know if I'm fooling you right now if you don't know the Bible. If you don't know the Bible, I can say anything I want to say. I can make you believe anything I want you to believe. It's ridiculous what people believe nowadays. It's ridiculous what people preach nowadays. Right? Uh, uh, that job that you, are, you want. That, 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 uh, that uh, promotion. It's yours. It's yours. You just have to know that you're good. You are a good person. No one is bad. God is concerned with what's best for you. God is concerned and wants to bring out the best you. Now, yeah, that, That's what they're doing. You can't even find that in the Word of God. That, that's why if you don't know the Word of God, what will you do? You're going to clap your hands. You, you're going to believe what they're saying. It is, it's really sad. If someone, someone can stand with the audacity to claim that I am the appointed son of God. And you give me all your money. You have to stay poor so that I remain rich. You have to buy me a jet. Actually, one, one preacher in the United States has three private jets. It's really difficult to wrap your mind around people who believe that. But it's happening. Why? They don't know the truth. Yeah. The, 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 the Paul says, if someone comes and preaches something different from what you have learned, stop believing them. Don't believe them. If you don't know the Bible, you will be fooled and you will be dragged uh, by, by people who are subtle, by the ministers of Satan, and you will live a very miserable life thinking that you're serving God, thinking that you're doing what you're doing for God, thinking that what you're doing, uh, your life is glorifying the Lord. But when you face the Lord in the judgment seat of Christ, He will say, hey, you never did anything right for me. Yeah. And you cannot blame that preacher. You can only blame your ignorance of the word of God. Uh, ye might well bear with him. Now, these people did not only let these people, uh, false prophets, preach the false doctrine, but they were bearing with them. They were listening to them. They were accepting them. Right? And this, this is the problem with the churches today. We tolerate false preaching. We tolerate false doctrine. Someone stands behind the pulpit. He wears nice clothes. He, he, he says his credentials. I have a church, thousands in attendance. I have this, I have that. I've done this, I've done that. Then you, you, your mindset is whatever he says must be true. Yeah. And even if he says something wrong, you tolerate it. Why? Hey, he's a great man of God. Just, just tolerate that. This, just just a, a, a small mistake. We don't have to bring that up. That is what these Corinthian people are doing. They're tolerating them. They're great preachers. They're great speakers. They, they are great orators. They speak, the, uh, they speak so well that these this, this worldly Christians, these carnal Christians were really astonished by them. So whatever they say, even if it's wrong, they're being tolerated. Okay? You might bear, uh, bear well with him. Uh, uh, even, even if they're preaching or teaching what is wrong, since they are the man of God, we just have to tolerate that, okay? Later on, we are, we are, we are going to do that. But here in our church, uh, we are open with that. Amen. That if what we preach is wrong, we're open to rebuke. We're open to correction. You can just chat. Don't stop us while we're preaching. That is not really nice. But you can, after the preaching, you can approach and say, that I think it's not really, the Bible's not really saying that. Or you can chat, or you can, uh, we can open the Bible. And if we're wrong, by the grace of God, we can admit that. Amen. Okay? Amen. For I suppose I was not a wit behind the very cheapest, chiefest apostles. Now, uh, there are, there's been a warm, uh, there's been debate about what chiefest apostles here mean. Uh, some people say that the chiefest apostles mean like Pope Peter and all these apostles that are that are considered better than him. But I believe that he is taking a shot again at these false 
uh, 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 prophets. Why? Because it doesn't really make sense that all the previous verses he was talking about false prophets and then he ch immediately changed gears to, to Peter and, and, and all these other apostles. Now, I believe this is sarcastic. Now, for I suppose that I was not a wit behind these chiefest apostles that you, 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 that you are claim to, to, be, to be better than me with you right now there at Corinth. Okay, uh, it doesn't make, uh, now, it says here in 11.6, but though I be rude in speech. Now, the, way, the word rude here me, doesn't mean that he uses bad words. The word rude means here is that he's unlearned. Or, or compared to them, he's nothing. Right, he's not really a good speaker. Paul is saying that he might not be as polished as a speaker as them. He might not be as learned as them. Uh, he might not be as good as, in, in speaking as them. Um, because I believe that Paul said that I am rude or I am unlearned or I am foolish because he does, it's, not, it's not that he's not really good. But I believe that it is by his choice. That is what I think. Because he knows that what I have to do is preach. I don't have to make people uh, uh, be amazed by how, by how I preach. I, I think he purposely makes himself look that he's nothing, that he's not really that good of a preacher, just so that his personality will not get in the way of the message of the Word of God. Yeah. You know, sometimes a person will preach a good message, but all you remember is his theatrics. Sometimes a preacher is too concerned with how he will be perceived as a preacher. Sometimes a preacher is too concerned with what people will think about his grammar. Sometimes people, a uh, preacher is too concerned with, ah, oh, what illustration am I going to use here? Who am I? Am I going to jump on the chair? Am I going to get a chair and hit someone with a chair? How can I drive home this point? You know, you just have to read the Word of God. Yeah. Yeah, you, you don't have to be, uh, you don't have to perform here. Preaching is not a performance. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. If you just say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, it means the same. Right? You don't have to, Go to the corner and, you know, <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it's not a shot at... Uh, the reason why he's always doing that is because he's a passion for preaching, you know? But it's not really, it's not really performing. But, but, you know, you can discern if someone is performing in front, right? You can discern that. Like, he uses the whole stage, uh, run to the back. You know, I, 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 uh, was, in a preacher, I was in a camp. He, he ran from the pulpit to the first row. And then, and then the people in first row had to really uh, go out of his way because he was going to jump on the chair. And then, then you see his uh, profile picture standing on top of the pulpit doing this with his Bible. And as if, if he doesn't that, that people are not going to get saved. You know, the Bible says the simplicity of preaching. Read the Bible, explain it, how the Holy Spirit explained it to you, and let the Holy Spirit do the working. You don't have to do any theatrics. Right? He says that even though I'm not really good in speaking, rude in speech, but not in knowledge. Amen. He said that I might not be good in speaking, but at least I know what I'm talking about. Yeah. That's what he's saying. You know, these people, they're good. Uh, they, 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 speak, they say nice words. They say deep words that you have to open a dictionary to understand. But they don't know what they're talking about. I know what I'm talking about. I know God. I know the Bible. They don't. Okay? An example of a person who doesn't know what he's talking about. I, I, I downloaded a video last night. That's the reason why I, I slept late. Play mo si, ano, yung paboritong preacher ni Deo. This is Deo's favorite, yeah. favorite preacher. Like him a sound. Because love will take you way further than the law ever could. I'll prove it to you. Let's say your child is in a horrible accident. Let's say they bust their head wide open on the monkey bars. And they fall off the monkey bars. And monkey bars are like 30 feet high. I'm making this an extreme example. And they fall down and they bust their head wide open. And you scoop them up and put them in the car to get them to the emergency room. And on the way to the emergency room, every sign you see says, uh, speed limit. How much attention do you pay to the numbers beneath the speed limit in that moment? Those numbers mean nothing to you. Why? Because somebody that you love is in trouble. And in that moment, any parent will break the law for the sake of love. Any human parent will break the law for the sake of love. And what will really turn your heart to God 
is not when you hear his laws, which were given for our good, by the way, but they were powerless because there wasn't enough leverage in our action to keep the law. So what God did when he sent his son, and this is why we get excited in church, and this is why tears fill our eyes when we think about Jesus, and this is why the gospel is still good news in the world today, because God broke the law for love. I said to every sinner, God broke the law for love. I mean that he scooped you up in his arms. I mean that he's carrying you in his grace. I mean that what the law was powerless to do and that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his son in the likeness of a sinful man. You see the, the last, the last, ver the last uh, phrase he said that Christ was made in the likeness of sinful men. With, with, a back, with background music. No, Christ was not made in the likeness of sinful men. We know that Christ uh, got uh, a human nature in order to jive with his godly nature in order to be able to save us. And, and uh, another, another thing is God did not break the law. God said, I am come to fulfill the law. Amen. Now, we know that the law that God is talking about is moral law. But, but God did not break the law per se. That's what he's saying. He's encouraging people to break the law. He's encouraging people to forget about the Bible. And the same preacher will tell you not to give too much attention in reading the Bible, in praying, just to give attention to what you think God is telling you personally. You know, there are these preachers again uh, uh, in the Philippines who I, he's a fat guy. Parang preacher siya ng G12. There's the G12, uh, 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 it's famous right now. There's this bow guy. And then there's this fat guy. He's saying that, uh, when I was a Bible student, all I know was to read the Bible, pray, and preach. Read the Bible, pray, and preach. It was not enough. I forgot about that. And then I start studying all these, uh, uh, all these uh, tactics on how to train people. He's saying that that's more important than reading the Bible, praying, and preaching. Now, these people, and, and you hear people clapping their hands. Why will you not clap your hands? While he was preaching, there was... There's, there's music and all, this, and all these props and all these uh, things that they think will help the preaching of the Word of God. It doesn't help at all. Yeah. Now, the, what, what's, what's more sad than that guy, I can't stand that guy, by the way, every time I watch him, but I should stop watching him. But what's, more, what's sadder than, 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 than that guy preaching and speaking about things that he don't understand, what's more sad is people who are agreeing with him. Yeah. Why? Because these people are lazy to find out the truth for themselves. They just go to a church, a mega church, a comfortable church with air condition, maybe snacks, maybe great coffee, maybe much better than the coffee we're having here. I'm not saying that it's bad because I love it. But uh, um, they, 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 they just go there and think that, hey, I want someone else to tell me what's right. I want someone else to tell me what's the truth because I don't have time to figure it out for myself. That's what's happening here in the Corinthian people. They're not, only uh, they're not only accepting these people, letting them preach behind the pulpit, but they're tolerating them. Paul says, hey, I might not be as good as them, but at least I know what I'm talking about. Amen. You know, truth is more important than how you're presenting it. Amen. Truth is more important. I can read the Bible here plainly. Someone can stand here and do circus, uh, circus moves in front of you, and the, just the plain reading of the Bible would be better for me. Yeah. You know, he says that, but we have been thoroughly manifest among you in all things. Not only that they're good, but we're preaching the truth. There's a difference. Another difference here is we are thoroughly manifest among you in all things. Paul says that I might not be as polished a speaker, but I am at least honest and transparent speaker. Okay? That's why we have, we don't, because one characteristic of a worldly Christian, worldly believer inside the church is it's looking at the presentation, it's looking at what the preacher uh, uh, is wearing, is looking at, at who, the preach, who the preacher will be, and depends on, depending on that, if he will listen or not. That is a worldly Christian. That is them, okay? That, uh, have I committed an offense in abasing myself? See how crazy that sounds? Have I committed an offense in abasing myself? Is it a sin to be humble? Is it a sin to, to, to uh, put myself down? Why? That you might be exalted? Is it, is it, is it, is it so bad? That I was that boasting? Is it so bad that I was that lifting up myself? Is it so bad to you that I was trying to do everything so that nothing will hinder the preaching of the truth? Okay? Because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely. Paul is saying, I didn't ask any money from you. Is it really that bad? Should I have, should I have asked money from you? You know, during the, those times, the, the, the culture was, if someone is speaking and he did not charge for it, 
he's an amateur. Just in our time, if, someone, uh, if you're playing basketball and you're not getting paid for it, you're an amateur, right? But if you're playing basketball and you're getting paid for it, you're a professional. So that's how they see Paul. He's not even asking for money. He might be, maybe he's an amateur. Maybe he doesn't really know what he's talking about. Now these people came here uh, dressed nicely, saying good words and asking for money. Hey, he must be a professional. Let leave him instead. Okay, that's what's happening. I robbed other churches taking wages of them to do you service. Now rob is a strong word here. But, uh, but, but that's what he's saying. I robbed other churches, uh, taking wages of them to do you service. What he means here is that when, while I was with you, while I was ministering to you, you were supposed to be the ones providing for my needs. But I didn't ask for it from you. I was asking from other churches so that I can survive while I was teaching you there. That's what, that's what he means. Here in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 4 to 11, it says here, Have we not power to eat and to drink? Have we not power to, to, to lead about a sister, as a, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as brethren of the Lord and Cephas? Or I only and Barnabas, have we not power to forbear working? Who goeth a warfare at any time as his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? Or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our, uh, for our sakes, no doubt, this is written. For uh, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope if we have sown unto you spiritual things is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things now this is what's happening to this 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 in first corinthians paul is saying that i i was i had the right to ask money from you i had the right to ask for support because i was serving you i was ministering to you but jumping to verse 15 it says but i have used none of these things neither have i written these things that it should be done unto me Okay, uh, for, it, for it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glorying void. This is how carnal these people are. This is how, uh, uh, what do you call this, how their minds are really far from the word of God. You know, Paul even thinks that they would be offended if he asked for support. So I will not ask for support. That's what Paul is saying. If, if Satan will just use this, uh, their money, uh, they're, they're, the fact that they're giving me money to hinder the preaching, I would rather die. That's what Paul is saying. Now this is what I'm doing. Jumping back to our, to our text here in 2 Corinthians, he said that this is still what I'm going to do. Because you're still not able to even accept that you have to, to, to support me. Okay? Uh, and when I was present with you and wanted, is that, uh, I forgot which verse we are. Nine. And when I was present with, with you and wanted, now Paul admitted that I, I needed some things when I was there. I was chargeable to no man, yet I asked not any one of you. I was chargeable. You cannot say to my face that you owe me. I gave you money. I gave you food. No one did. Uh, no one did that to him. For that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied. This was particularly embarrassing yeah. because people from Macedonia are poor. They were in deep poverty, but they were the ones giving money to Paul so that he can survive while ministering to these rich Corinthian people. Yeah. That, is how, that is how embarrassing that is. this is. Now, Paul uh, uh, shifted from boasting to embarrassing them in order for them to realize the truth. And, and, and in all things... Uh, and all things have I kept myself from being burdensome unto you. And so will I keep myself. Not only money. I did not even ask you for any favor. In all things, I, w I did not burden any of you. Now, I'm not saying that this is what a pastor should do. Because a pastor is entitled to support. But these people are so carnal. So uh, non-discerning that they cannot understand these things. Uh, as the truth of Christ is in me, and it's, then this, is, uh, this is truth, no man shall stop me of boasting in the regions of Achaia. I can, I can continue, preach, continue preaching about this, that I didn't ask anything from you everywhere I go. I can keep boasting about that, okay? You're, it's, it's embarrassing. You're being embarrassed whenever I'm saying that to other people. Wherefore, because I love you not. Now, now people, people here think that by not taking money, by not burdening them, by not really doing that to them, some people, I don't know how, translated it into, hey, maybe he doesn't really love us. Because he's asking money from other churches, but not from us. Baka hindi niya talaga tayo mahal. No, what's, what, is, what is Paul's uh, answer? God knoweth. 
God knoweth, I love you. I'm doing this because I love you. I don't want the gospel to be hindered at all because I want you first to understand. It's been years. Still, they still don't understand. But what I do, that I will do. I will continue doing that. From 1 Corinthians to the letters that he written, he's written to, until the very end of 2 Corinthians, it has not changed. Okay, again, uh, let's put it into context. He's talking to a minority of people, people in the church that really don't understand this. Now, I will still not burden you, for you are still not able to bear this, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion. Now, again, a shot at this false uh, prophets saying that I will still not get money from you so that this false prophet cannot use that to, 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 uh, to destroy my person, uh, my character more unto you. Or for them, we, or, or uh, we can interpret it in another way so that you will see the difference between me and the false prophets that are present among you. Now they're asking for money because they're good speakers, they're professionals, you're giving them money, they're asking, I'm not. This is embarrassing. I'm not asking. I know what I'm saying, I'm telling you the truth, I'm sacrificing for you, yet you are putting your loyalty to these false prophets who are just, what are they doing for such a false, false prophets, okay? Deceitful workers who are just deceiving you, okay? What are they? They seek occasion to destroy Paul. They're just making money out of you. You're still giving your loyalty to these people rather than me, okay? That preacher that, I, that we watched a while ago, he's rich. He's not rich because God bless him. It's rich because people gave money. Right. Joel Austin, you can't get into his church without buying a ticket. Right? Uh, uh, this, uh, I forgot their name. Uh, the, the, the preacher in America has three private jets. I don't know how, what he will do with three private jets. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to know his name, maybe. Uh, there, there's there's uh, 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 false preachers in the Philippines who are just making themselves rich. What's more sad is even in among our ranks, this is happening. They might be as blatant, uh, not, not as blatant, uh, false, uh, t they might not be preaching uh, obvious false preaching, but they're, if you're wise and if you know the Bible, they're going towards that. Yeah. Uh, they're not asking you for a jet. They're not asking for tickets to get into their uh, uh, churches, but they are asking one month's salary. And they can't prove that in the Bible. Hey, you have to give equivalent of one, at least equivalent of your one month's salary. And where does that money go? At the discretion of the pastor. The pastor can do anything he wants to do with that money. Imagine having 500 members giving you at least an amount of one month of their salary and then trusting that the pastor will use it for the betterment of the church. A mere man, a man who can be easily corrupted, a man who can easily be beguiled by the devil to give that amount of money to him, that's no different than people asking for private jets. Yeah. It's just in a smaller scale, but it's, complete, but it's the same thing. Now, the Bible says they are deceitful workers. They claim that they're for God, but they're not. They claim that they're doing the ministry, the ministry of God, but they're not. They're transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. These people are very smart. These people are very subtle. No one will come here preaching obvious false doctrine. And we will believe them. No. The reason why they were deceived is because they were mixing truth with false. Yeah. There's mixing truth with error. It's like this. I am the man of God. Correct. I am placed here to oversee you. Correct. I'm taking, of, taking care of your spiritual growth. Correct. I am answerable to God for what I will do to this church. Correct. Yeah. Therefore, I am not answerable to you. Wrong. A, a lot of correct things one mistake at the end can destroy a whole church. Yeah. That's why people can easily believe that. Right. You know, everything he said was correct, but he is answerable to the church. He's a member of the church. He is answerable to the discipline of the church. Yeah. But you will not be able to. Do. I remember the very first preaching I preached here. The problem of these Corinthian people was they were not discerning at all. They cannot discern that. They say amen to everything. They say yes to everything without knowing if it's correct or not. And we should not be, hindi uh, dapat magtaka. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Okay, therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. That's why I don't understand why pastors today say, do not judge salvation of people inside the church. I don't understand that. The time of Paul, he's saying that there are false brethren among you. 
There are people who are transforming themselves into a minister of God, but they're just fooling you. There are wolves among you. If during this time there are wolves, how much more during our time? There are so many. It's true even in this church. There are, that's why we are being purged by the Lord. That's why the Lord is manifesting that in our means. Why? Because there are false brethren. We should not shy away from that. Because if we start shying away for, from that, then we stop being careful accepting people. And if we stop being careful, then the devil can easily destroy the church. Kaya nga po dapat ingatan natin. Huwag po tayong maniwala sa, hey, you cannot judge my salvation. You cannot judge who's saved or not. You, you, you better not talk about that. You know, the, the Bible talks about that. I'm going to talk about that. Amen. The Bible clearly says that a saved person will manifest his salvation. If it's not manifesting that he is not saved, plain and simple. I'm not saying that just to, to, just to mark people. I'm saying that to help people understand that. that but because maybe you're one of the people who are not really saved. You just prayed a prayer, we're going to church, born in a Christian family, thinking you're saved, but you're actually not. You're someone that the devil has planted in the church. That this is happening. Now, how, now what, what challenge can, I, can, I, can we get from these 15 verses? Brother, I believe as I continue studying the, the book of 2 Corinthians, the warnings here, the principle is applied to our church today. All of these things are applied in our church today. If this, peop this is happening to these people thousands of years ago, it can be happening to us. It will happen to us if, like them, we're not careful. If, like them, we will think too much of ourselves. If, like them, we will, not, we will forget to study the Word of God. If, like them, we will have bad attitude towards leadership. If, like them, we are not going to love the Lord with all our hearts. If, like them, we are going to give our loyalty to people instead of God. This can happen to us. Exactly this can happen to us. And it's a sad thing if it happens to us. It might be happening already. We might be on our way there already. The reason why God gave this Bible, this, this warnings, this, 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 uh, this epistles of the Apostle Paul, is so that we are going to guard ourselves. Guard our church. As I, as I have always said, it starts with the individual. Do you want to be a scriptural church? Each individual has to be studying the Bible. Do you want to be a prayerful church? Each individual has to be prayerful. Do you, have, do you want to, to, to be a church that is pure? Each individual has to continue to examine ourselves and know that we are really in the will of God. Now the challenge here this morning is, let's pray to the Lord that we're not going to be like this. We're not going to start on a path that, is, that, will be, that we will be on our way to a church that's not glorifying the Lord anymore. That we are going to be constantly careful of our actions, constantly careful of our ways, of our attitude towards each other, towards the pulpit, towards the, towards the members, towards the leadership. We, are always, we always have to be careful in our attitude, especially towards the Word of God. For everything hinges on that. And if we stop respecting the Word of God, if we stop looking at the Word of God, if we stop studying the Word of God, then we are well on our way to be a carnal people like these people here at Corinth. So that is the challenge. Take it as a personal challenge. I will not be the member in this church who will destroy the unity. I will not be the person in this church who will, who will start rebellion. I will not be the member of this church who, will start, uh, who, who Satan will use to destroy the unity of this church. The, uh, that, is, that is my challenge to you this morning. And I pray that you will be able to take that and pray to the Lord that He will help you. Let us uh, all stand and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you once again for uh, the preaching. Thank you for your word. For the things that we have learned and studied, I pray, Lord, that you uh, continue to mold us into the Christian that you want us to be. And Lord, just like the song says, uh, to always remind us, and not only just remind us, Lord, but to, to always make us realize what we are uh, doing and what we are now, our standing before you. And if we are not correct, if we are not walking on the path that you want us to walk, I pray, Lord, that you always uh, just remind us to, to go back to the truth, to go back to your word, and to always uh, do things according to the scriptures. I pray, Lord, that as we strive to be a scriptural church, as we strive to be a church that will glorify your name, that each individual will strive to live lives that, is glorif that will glorify your name as well. And we know that everything will be taken, will take care of itself. I pray Lord, that your name will be continue to continue to be glorified uh, today, uh, even in the service this afternoon, and the things that we're going to do. For all these things, I pray in Jesus' name.